I ask you to turn with me to Proverbs this morning, chapter 31. Read a few verses. I'm going to start in verse 10. If you find that spot, stand your feet in the reverence of reading God's Word. Probably read down several verses. The proverb says, Who can find the virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have need of spoil, no need of spoil. She'll do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, and she works willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night, and she gives meat to her household, a portion to her maidens. She considers a field, and she buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds her loin with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that, the, that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes not out by night. She lets her hands by the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hands to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow of, of, for her household. And for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes herself coverings of tapestry and her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes fine linen and sells it, delivers girdles unto the merchants. The strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness, and her children arise up and call her blessed. Her, her husband also, he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. The Lord has blessed us uh, with mothers. We've got many, many mothers in the house. and um, I believe that uh, we've got some that are with child. We've got some with young children and some with grown children that are gone and moved out and different things. But, but uh, I believe that, that uh, mothers are a very special part of God's creation plan. Mothers are, are, are different than men. Uh, they're, they're different than fathers. And, uh, we have to understand that in order to operate the way that God wants us to because mothers have a, have a, a wonderful part in God's plan. And I, I believe that that, that you mothers should be celebrated. I believe that you ought to be celebrated this morning. I believe that, that God uh, has chosen you uh, to shape His people. I believe God has chosen you to raise up leaders. Listen to me. Don't fiddle. Let me preach for a few minutes. You're going to want this. God has chosen you to raise up leaders. God has chosen you to add to His kingdom. God has chosen you to redeem nations. God has chosen you to reach the lost. Mothers. That's what He created you to do. That's how He, that's how he put this thing together. And a mother has uh, more influence than most powerful people in the history of, of time. Because even a king and even a president and even dignitaries and, and people in high places, they have a mother. They have a mother. And so a mother is before all those things. And even, even when a man or a, a woman is in one of those high places, the mother still has authority over them in that place, according to the Scripture. You still have the right to tell them what to do. You still have the right to intervene in their life. You still have the right to tell them right and wrong. No matter what position a person is in. God has put you over those things. And He done that with a master plan. And He done it with a master purpose. And we forget that. We forget that. As a church, we need to celebrate that. We need to know that. We need to rejoice in that. And we need to be sure that we live like that. In Genesis 3, God chose the woman. Even in her sin, God chose the woman to work 
through the redemption plan for mankind. God chose the woman to give the seed that would bruise the heel, that would bring salvation. You say, wow, I, I, I didn't realize that. Well, well, he didn't choose me. Yes, he did. You're a woman. You're a mother. That's what he's chosen you to do. And, and, and so he, he's chosen to use a, a woman to help work that plan and redeem us of our sins. And you know what he told the men? You know what he told Adam? Adam, you're going to go to work. That's right. <clears throat> you know, well, we don't talk like that in Baptist churches. I'm telling you, I'm talking about the Bible. He said, Adam, you're going to go to work and you're going to work with your hands and the sweat of your brow and there's going to be thorns and thistles and trouble and a, and a sore back and heartache. And woman, I'm going to use you to redeem the mess that you made. Well, it sounded like a curse. No, the curse was the sin. The promise was through the sin of the woman. And, and so... So we have to understand the position and the place of a woman. We have to understand the position and the place of God's redemption plan through a mother. That's what he planned. Y'all okay? We're going to preach a minute. i got a lot to go. And, and I hope that you leave out here uh, upright, ready to do what God's created you to do and called you to do. When my children were born, I knew that it would take both of us to raise them. I knew that. If I get in your pocket, hang on. I knew that it would take my wife and myself to raise them. I knew that. And I knew that it was important that I got over myself and got into what God was doing with His creation. I knew that was important. I knew that it would take both of us to raise them. But I didn't know for sure how much that she would have an advantage over me as mother. I didn't know some of the things that God had, had, had put in her that He didn't put in me. Such as things, how you know 10 minutes early that they're fixing to cry because they're hungry? I don't know that. She did. How you know when they're hurt and they ain't even nowhere around you can't even hear them but you just know something wrong? Mom's got some kind of weird godly radar deal going. But, 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 but she had all these advantages in motherhood that I didn't have as a father, as a dad. I didn't understand those things. I, how She had such an advantage. Uh, the way that she knew things and the way that she felt things and the way that she could accomplish things. And these are according to God's design that no one else could do those things. No one else could do those things. I, I don't understand it all. I'm not a doctor. I wish there was. Amen. I can pretend like one. But I do know this, that something, when a child is reared in a mother and that baby grows in a mother, raise your hand if you're a child this morning. We got a few. Who, who, you know, you know, Craig. Miss Charity is. Miss Charity is. There's, there's several here in the church. But what I'm telling you, in the, over that nine month process, God, there's some kind of connection there that God puts together. There's something that happens that don't quit happening. And so this, a mother has this advantage. And they're able to accomplish things differently. The Bible says this, and I, I've got three points, and I'll preach them quickly. But the number one thing, one of the things that you are, mothers, you're a teacher. We're looking at this Proverbs 31 woman. You are a teacher. You're a teacher. You don't have a choice but to teach your children. You, you, what you do is, is in the role of a teacher. So, and so with that being said, when we read 30, Proverbs 31, which is probably the most popular chapter in Proverbs, verse 1, we didn't read that yet, but we're going to. In verse 1, the Bible says in, in 31, 1, the words of King Lamuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Proverbs 31 was told to a man that grew up to become a king and he had heard that because his mother told him that prophecy and he shared it with us. Amen. He shared Proverbs 31 with us, but he learned that from his mother. His mother taught him that proverb, that, that prophecy. It's not a proverb, it's, it's a prophecy. And the things that you teach your children um, 
listen closely, should and will talk what the world teaches them. The things that you teach them will talk what the world teaches them. I promise you. I promise you that. That this, this king had a, was a man of influence. Um, he he um, uh, had a, a lot of power. The Bible doesn't say a lot about uh, King Lemuel. As a matter of fact, uh, you're not going to find him in anywhere else in the Scripture except here in Proverbs 31. But he was nevertheless a king. The Bible says he was a king. I figured he was a king. Amen. And in, in ancient times, a king was sovereign. His decisions were pretty much sovereign. His, his choices, his leadership was pretty much sovereign. The only way you could change him was by killing him. You didn't get over on him. But the king could have said anything. And the king could have taught anything. But you know what he did? He began to share with, 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 with his people. And he began to share with you all um, what his mama had said. He began to tell what mama said. He began to understand that, hey, my mom planted this in me sometime. And it's worth sharing. It's a, something that's prophetic. Something that will mean something. And so many people today have surrendered their responsibilities to teach their children. So many people have surrendered their responsibilities, and I believe it's a lie from the devil. You know what? Can, can I? Is it okay if we preach? Did you know what I found out is dad? I can't talk about it's not Father's Day, but can I tell you what I found out when my children were born? If I didn't want my children to do what I was doing, then I need to quit doing it. Come on, somebody. Why? Because do as I say, not as I do. Don't work. It don't work. You can talk it all day long, but turn around, wait a couple of years, and watch. Well, I don't want my kids to grow up like I grow up. I don't want my kids to, to do the things that I do, the things that I fall into, the sin trap, the strongholds, the things that, that has brought me to a point in my life where I am today. I don't want my children to wind up that way now. Then you need to repent right now. You need to stop the way your behavior. You need to start serving God with all your heart. Say, well, I don't know how to. You never will unless you start. It won't happen until you do it. I don't want my kids to have the same problems I have. Then change it. You're the teacher. You're the teacher. And God offers us all the help, every promise, everything that it's going to take to do it. It's there. We have to do it. I'm going to tell you something. If God whacked us in the head with a hammer every time that we thought He wanted us to do something, you wouldn't have a head. Amen? He didn't knock your head clean off. God don't do that. The Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He offers it and the Spirit says, come. And the bride says, come. It's there. But it's hard. There are things, a million things, that I do not want my son to do things that I've done. But you know what? If he does them, it won't be because he saw me do them. And I'll tell you this. I believe by faith in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, that what I teach my children will outdo what the world teaches them. Amen. That's right. We have surrendered our responsibility. People say, I want my children to learn on their own. They say, I want my children to make their own decisions about who they are. They say, I want my children to, to believe what they want to believe. I want them to pick their own religion. I want them to pick how they will live. Listen, somebody's going to teach them. If you're mad at me for that, sorry about you. Love. What I'm telling you is somebody's going to teach them. Well, I want them to. Some of this stuff is ridiculous. You're not going to step the responsibility that God's given you. But somebody will teach them. You want them to pick their own way? They can't. They haven't been taught it yet. You want them to believe what they choose to believe? They can't. They, it's impossible. Because they haven't been taught it yet. It don't even make sense. Which tells me it's a lie from the devil. 
which tells me we need to get off of it. Amen? It's not my children's choice whether or not if they go to church, ask them. It's not my children's choice what they want to watch and what they don't want to watch. Ask them. It's not my children's choice what they wear and what they don't wear if it becomes inappropriate. Ask them. It's not their choice. When it's time to get up and go to work, it's time to get up and go to work. When you're told to do something, you do it. If you don't want to do it, there's a consequence. Why? Because that's the way of the world. Amen. Who's supposed to teach them that? The world? No, sir. No, sir. The world will teach them. You can go on Thursday night. We'll go to church and have a jail on Thursday night. The world will teach them. And then we'll cry and we'll get in the altar and we'll pout and we'll fear and we'll fret. Because the world taught them. We'll pray for a miracle. God said, I already done a miracle. I, I used you in creation and give you the Holy Ghost to boot. It's us. It's our responsibilities and not just moms, it's dads. we got to figure this out because somebody will teach them. But you are the teacher. And no one can just make their own decisions. No one will just, listen, they'll run into influence. They'll be unprotected without your teaching. They'll be unprotected without your teaching. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. It didn't say he'll come running back to it. It didn't say maybe he'll remember it. It, did, it said, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Which means, what? He didn't leave it. What was taught him stayed in there. What was taught worked. It lasted forever. Does that mean nobody will ever make a decision? Man, if you don't think your kids are going to make bad decisions, don't believe that. Don't think that. That's not the truth. They're going to make bad decisions. But we have to teach them. It's our job to teach them. Tell them about Jesus, Mom. Tell them about grace. Tell them about mercy. Tell them about living for a purpose bigger than themselves. Tell them about those things. Show them what forgiveness is. Show them unconditional love. Can I tell you how I learned unconditional love? When my mom picked me up from jail one Saturday morning and got in the car, I wish she'd have brought a taser or something just got to smooth out. She said, well, I don't like what you've done, but you won't never do anything that caused me not to love you. Amen. It can't be right. She said, oh, you won't you won't accomplish it. You live like an idiot twist your life if that's your decision. But you will not make me not love you. Somebody has to teach your kids that. Teach them about unconditional love. Why? Because that's the love of God. Make sure they always know there's hope in the Lord. And when the world gets done with them, they'll pick what Mama said. Because you're the teacher. You are... The prayer director, the prayer director. Mama's prayers direct everything. It's by design, church. It's by design. I don't just say things without showing you something in the Bible. I'm going to show you something. Mamas, mamas are the prayer directors. And so your prayers and the things that you talk to God about in between your children and, and the Lord. Uh, they, they set a path and it, it sets a, de a design, a direction. And, and a mother has the burden before the child. The mother has the burden uh, during the childbearing months. The mother has the burden during birth. The mother has the burden after birth. The mother is the one who designs the direction. There's a woman in the Bible named Hannah. She was Samuel's mom. And, and, and she was barren. Samuel, or uh, Hannah was barren. She couldn't, she was having trouble having a child. And her husband, Elkanah, uh, he, he, he wasn't thinking, uh, listen to me. 
Elkanah wasn't thinking about the son that wasn't born. Elkanah wasn't sitting up at night as a little girl thinking, one day I'm going to have me a baby. One day I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to hold a baby. I'll tell you something. I never thought about that once in my whole life until my wife said, I'll hold my baby. <laughs> Sure. Never thought about that. Now, Connor wasn't the one thinking about this boy before he was born. Was. Oh man, she was praying. She was praying about who he'd be. She was praying about what he would do. She was praying about what she needed to do to get ready for him. She was praying and thanking and searching God. But now, Connor wasn't thinking about that. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8. And there then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why have you not eaten? And why is your heart grieved? She wanted a child. She was thinking about her child. Verse 10 says that she was in bitterness of soul and she prayed a prayer unto the Lord and she wept. She prayed for him. She prayed for Samuel before his feet ever hit the ground. She thought about Samuel's direction before he ever had a direction. That's what she did. She, in verse 11 it says this. Listen, Mom. She vowed a vow. She said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid and remember me and not forget me, but if you'll give unto me your handmaid, a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there be no razor come upon his head. Well, in today's society, we think something different about that. She said, I'll give him to the Lord. All the days of his life. She didn't say not all the days of my life. She said, I'm gonna, Lord, if you give me a child, I'm going to give him to you. And it, I'm going to do that for the rest of his life. All the days of his life. I am, as mom, am going to give him to you. She had the right to do that. So I never thought about that. Well, how can she say that and it make the, the Holy Scripture if that wasn't the case? She had the right to to do that for, for her child, between her child and her God. Some say this isn't fair to Samuel. Some say, well, it wasn't fair for Samuel to be given to the Lord. He should have had a say-so in that. But it was her child. What would have been unfair to Samuel For her not to give him to the Lord. What would have been unfair to Samuel was for her to give him to the devil. Or just give him over to the world. Or maybe just set him out, like kick him out of the nest, just hope the best thing happens. What would have been fair? But she made a decision. She said, no. No. That boy belongs to the Lord. And I'm going to give him to the Lord all every day of his life he's going to be to, with the Lord. I'm going to give him to the Lord over and over and over. And of course, she had this right to pray and she had this right to give her son to God. He gave him to her in the first place. So her and the Lord came to this agreement that we all need to come to about our children. Listen, so let me say this and wrap that part up. That'll, that'll make this make real sense. Moms, dads also, moms, if you don't have a direction for their life, how can they? If you don't have a direction towards the Lord for your children, how can they? Where will they find them? Where will they get it? They can't have a correct path if somebody won't start it. You direct the path from the beginning. Number three, 
You are the faith installer. The virtuous woman had a plan. The virtuous woman worked that plan by faith. She did those things by faith. Verse 28 said, And her children call her blessed, and her husband praises her. And, and so when we look at Samuel, I want you to understand that Samuel was one of the, the most prominent prophets in the Old Testament. He, he, he was the, the, one of the, the most uh, used prophets in the Old Testament. He influenced people. But they have to have faith in God. And you instill that or install that. In 2 Timothy, I'm almost done. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul is writing to Timothy. And Timothy was a young preacher. Timothy was a young servant of God, a young man. Uh, Timothy uh, was a, a biracial. Timothy had a, a, a Jewish mother and a Greek father. And, and let me just help you to understand because in America we think everybody's a Christian. Well, that was not the case. Because the, the, the Jews and the Greeks hated each other. They didn't think the like the same. They didn't have the same God. They didn't have the same practices. They didn't have the same culture. And so Timothy had a Jewish mom and a Greek dad. And you say, well, and by the way, Timothy was a boy. He was a young man. And we say, well, this, this would have never worked in my house. If Jenna would look at me and said, all right, you raise this one, and I'll raise the other. I don't even know where the other one is. <laughs> you raise this and I'll raise that. It don't work. It ain't never worked. But you would think, well, maybe the boy would follow the dad. Maybe Timothy should have been Greek. Mom has, I'm telling you something, Mom. I'm telling you something. It don't work that way. So whenever, so I would say this, okay, first off, what they were teaching didn't have no power behind it, so Timothy didn't buy it. But faith in God wound up being what Timothy's whole life was lived for. Timothy lived his whole life to serve the Lord. And it wasn't easy. And Paul rem reminded him and he wrote him in 1 Timothy about this faith that he had, this unfeigned faith that was in him. You say, well, how did he get that faith? How did that get in him? How did that happen? Well, let me read it to you. First, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. He said, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois. I hope somebody gets this. Yes, when I, so Timothy, when I think about that unfeigned faith that you have, the first, it started in your grandmother Lois. Oh, yeah, and also in your mother Eunice. And somehow or another, they instilled, installed, displayed, showed, proved, taught that and I am persuaded that that is also in you. Somehow it got in there. Somehow it was in there. It didn't just show up. His dad was a pagan worshiper. His dad and his teachings had a tendency to murder children. But not his mom. His mama. Listen this morning. I want to challenge you. You can duck yourself how you want to. Maybe you want to come this morning and spend some time in prayer. One or two things ought to happen. First off, you say, well, Ryan, I've been on the wrong road. I don't know how to back up and do what I need to do. Listen, we're still tired. Today's the day. Amen. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of salvation. You say, well, I don't know how to go forward from here. I'm going to tell you the first step. Give your life to Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you the first step. Give your life to Christ Jesus this morning. And watch your family follow. But you're the teacher. You're the prayer director. And you're the faith installer. And I thank God for you. I thank God that we have that in our church. Some people used to say this and take it wrong. 
Well, instead of women doing everything at the church, my first challenge would be men step up. I'm going to tell you something. The job's getting done. Men, the work's getting done. There's faith being installed. There's prayers being answered. God's doing things when we pray to these mamas. I tell these mamas sometimes when troubles come, and there's trouble, there's troubles today. I tell you, mama says, if, you, if you've ever talked to me about something, I say, I don't know that you understand the power of a praying mama. God will move heaven and earth to answer your prayers by faith. Why? Because you're a mama. You're part of the plan. His plan is going to begin. This morning, grab your babies and pray with them. This morning, ask God to help you out of a hole so that you can serve it. Don't ask God to help you out of a hole so you can serve yourself. Well, thank man, I've done that. That don't work. <laughs> ask God to help you out of a hole so you can serve Him. 